I found Lucy back in the canyon. What was she? What do you want me to do? Draw your picture? Spell it out? Red River, I think, is a dry run. I think Tom Dunson's a dry run for Ethan Edwards. Except Ethan Edwards takes him much deeper and darker than even Dunson uh, goes in Red River. Uh, but Wayne was never afraid of being disliked as an actor. Hi, I'm Rob Ward. Welcome to A Word on Westerns, where we talk about Westerns. And today I have a guest who not only talks about Westerns, he writes about them. His name is Scott Eyman, a best-selling author who's written books about John Wayne, Cecil B. DeMille, Henry Fonda, Jimmy Stewart, Robert Wagner, and he is spectacular as a writer. I bumped into him. Well, I sat with him. I didn't really bump into him during the Lone Pine Film Festival a couple of years ago and put together a couple of short segments from our interview. What I've done for today is I've edited all of them together in honor of our month-long tribute to John Wayne. That's right. May is a word on Wayne, and I'm glad you joined us today. You're going to like hearing Scott talk. I love his voice. He should be a radio guy, but he's a terrific author. If you don't have his books, run out and get them. If you like content like this, please subscribe and don't forget to check out our Patreon page. You can watch all of our shows with no commercials. So here he is, Scott Eyman, talking about our heroes, John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, and Henry Fonda. I think John Wayne would have been a success in any business he went into. If he'd gone into law, he'd been a successful lawyer. If he'd gone into the circus, he'd been a circus operator. Because uh, he went into the movie business, became a successful movie star. Because he was an achiever and uh, a workaholic, frankly, and uh, uh, tended to go through obstacles rather than around obstacles. Um, but if you look at a John Wayne movie from 1937, 38, and you look at a John Wayne movie from 1932, he's, he just gets much better. He's more natural, he's, uh, he knows what to do with his hands. Uh, he's, still got a, he's still a movie star, but he's also an actor. He knew Ford from when he had been a prop boy. At Fox. At Fox. Uh, at Fox. Out of, out of college, mm -hmm. and what was it that Ford saw in him that, one, made him hold out for Duke in Stagecoach, mm -hmm. and two, why did he wait so long? He was waiting for Duke to get better. If he tried to do Stagecoach in 1935, I don't think Duke could have carried the picture because it was, he was going to cast it with a premier list of character actors, Hollywood's best character actors, Thomas Mitchell, Claire Trevor, George Bancroft, Andy Devine, John Carradine. These guys are all complete pros, and they would have overwhelmed the John Wayne of 1933 or 1935. By 1938 or 39, he could meet them on their own terms, you know? Uh, and also, Ford sculpted the picture around Wayne. His immense likability, his charm, his physical grace, uh, the way he had of reacting without seeming to react. Take it easy, Gatewood. We may need that fight before we get to the ferry. You wouldn't be much good enough to fight, you jailbird! Wayne's reactions become our reactions as you watch the picture. So it's, it's a very self-conscious showcase on Ford's part for his friend Duke Wayne. Without Ford, would Wayne have become a star? I think he would have gone on to bigger and better things. I don't know that he would have become John Wayne, American icon, without Ford. If you take Ford's pictures out of Wayne's filmography, it's an entirely different career. His dying day, he believed that he owed his career to John Ford. I'm not so sure. Howard Hawks obviously saw something in Wayne that, that Ford did not mm -hmm. uh, and cast him as the older man right. in Red River. But would he have done that if Wayne had not already shown in movies like uh, They Were Expendable and Stagecoach and Long Voyage Home that he could command the screen and also act? You know, I doubt it. I, I suspect Wayne would have been a, a lower level leading man action, leading man action hero, uh, if not the quite, quite the heights that he would have come to. But he was, he was not going to be a Republican monogram for all his life. That wasn't going to happen. Why do you think when The Searchers came out, which is revered as, as one of the greatest films ever made, not just Westerns, mm -hmm. but greatest films, it was sort of looked over in 1956 when it was released, mm -hmm. and 
It's perhaps Wayne's most powerful performance. I found Lucy back in the canyon. What was she? What do you want me to do? Draw you a picture? Spell it out? At the time, in 1956, as, as John Ford, I think, told Peter Bogdanovich, the general attitude was, oh, there goes senile old John Ford out to Monument Valley again. It's another John Wayne, John Ford Western. And people tended to overlook the individuality of the pictures and just sort of lump them together as if they were indivisible, like Three Musketeers pictures from Republic in 1937, where there really isn't much to differentiate between the movies and the, and the way they're made and the direction of the pictures. But uh, Ford's vision was beginning to darken, metaphorically, and probably literally as well. Uh, and Wayne was willing to meet the challenge, because Red River, I think, is a dry run. I think Tom Dunson's a dry run for Ethan Edwards, except Ethan Edwards takes him much deeper and darker than even Dunson uh, goes in Red River. Uh, but Wayne was never afraid of being disliked as an actor. He wanted to be respected. That was more important to him than like or dislike. And uh, the same could be said of Ethan Edwards and Tom Dunson. They didn't care if you liked them. They just cared if you respected them, and they intended to be respected. Is, is that a trait that you think Wayne looked for in parts that he, he took uh, in his later career? Oh, yeah. He told me in that conversation we had at CBS that he would tell writers, look, I'll play anything you want. I, I can do anything you want me to do. Don't write me small. Don't write me petty. That I will not do. I want to play someone large, you know, of size, physical and moral and emotional size. So Wayne was not going to play uh, about a, a movie about an academic struggling to get tenure. You know, or an accountant worried about a promotion. He just he wasn't going to go there. He was going to play men uh, with large appetites and large ambitions. In World War II, actor James Stewart was a flight commander and a hero. Officially 19 bombing missions as a pilot in B-24s. There were a few more than that, where he was uh, accompanying uh, a sortie as a commander uh, and, and went along. So it was probably more like 23, 24 in total. After the war, James Stewart made a career-changing move as an independent actor with no studio attachments, making a revolutionary deal for two films in 1950 at Universal with his agent at the time, Lou Wasserman. One of those films was a Western. I think World War II and his service in the Air Force during World War II was the making of him as an actor. The classic Stewart performances uh, after the war, excluding It's a Wonderful Life, which I think he probably could have played before the war. Well, Winchester 73 was an add-on. Nobody cared about Winchester 73. The picture they cared about was Harvey, uh, which Stewart had done on Broadway uh, for two summers when Frank Fay, who originated the part of Elwood Dowd, went on vacation. And I think it was he was basically taking a screen test that he wanted to play the part of Elwood B. Dowd with the giant puka friend, uh, invisible friend. Uh, so Universal wanted him because it's ideal casting. Uh, the only problem was Stewart's price was $200,000 a picture at that point, plus a percentage, a small percentage. And uh, Universal didn't have the $400,000. It was out of their price range, frankly. Uh, and they wanted him to do Harvey, which was the important picture. And also they had this Western that Fritz Lang was preparing called Winchester 73. And he thought that was fine, uh, but he wanted his money, and Universal didn't have that kind of money uh, to throw around for a star. So Wasserman suggested, well to Stewart, why don't we just take 50% of the profits? Both of them figuring that Harvey would be extraordinarily commercial and Winchester 73 would do whatever Western did, you know? Because it wasn't going to cost anything, particularly. So Universal said, okay. And Harvey, he did Harvey first, and Harvey went out and did okay. But it was no smash hit by any stretch of the imagination. And then he did Winchester 73, which uh, completely unexpectedly was a smash hit. Uh, and with his 50% of the profits on Winchester 73, he made $800,000, which also was taxed at the capital gains rate, which is about half of what straight salary was taxed at. So he made out like a bandit on Winchester 73. And uh, as word got around Hollywood, uh, what he was making on this little black and white Western that cost $900,000 and change, under a million dollars, it really started, actors started uh, thinking, well, why do I need to be under contract? Why not freelance? Why do I need to take this paycheck that I'm paying 90% in taxes on? Uh, so it really changed the way actors thought about issues of security versus risk. And Jimmy's performance in that, he had not played such a, a man with festering hate. Where are you? 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 Where are you?
Wait. Wait. I think World War II and his service in the uh, Air Force during World War II is the making of him as an actor. The classic Stuart performances uh, after the war, excluding It's a Wonderful Life, which I think he probably could have played before the war. Uh, but I don't think he could have played, gotten near uh, Winchester 73 or The Man from Laramie or Vertigo uh, before the war. I think the war, in, it, it gave him a reservoir of anxiety and fear and emotional stress that he could not express in his daily life because it wasn't acceptable. Uh, but he could express it through his work. And it filled up that reservoir. And it also, his work allowed him to disperse those feelings of anxiety and stress uh, in a way that was very positive for him. The book's called Hank and Jim. And it's about the friendship uh, between Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart, who were best friends for 50 years, by actual count, 50 years, from 1932 to 1982 when Fonda died. They lived together in New York as starving young actors during the Depression. They both went to Hollywood within six months of each other, and they lived together in Hollywood in Brentwood in rented houses. Uh, Fonda got married first. Then they went off to war. When the war was over, uh, they came back to Hollywood, and Stewart moved in with uh, Fonda's uh, uh, a house again because Stewart's house had been leased and had six months to go on the lease, so he moved into Peter and Jane Fonda's uh, playhouse on the, uh, the Fonda Ranch. Uh, and lived there for six months amidst a bunch of cats that uh, had taken up residence. So he had to coexist with a bunch of uh, 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 cats. Uh, and Jane Fonda to this day says, I'm the, only, I'm the only person who knew Jimmy Stewart in a cat house. <laughs> Fonda had, of course, been known as the American icon from Young Abe Lincoln and, and uh, Tom Joad and Grapes of Wrath. And Sergio Leone wanted to put a real spin on that. What was it about the casting of Fonda in that part that Leone uh, wanted to accomplish? Well, he wanted to use the idea of Fonda's integrity and turn it 180 degrees. Because Fonda was always kind of stoic and removed, even as a hero, even in uh, Tom, as Tom Joad in The Grapes of Wrath or as juror, the juror in uh, 12 Angry Men or as Abe Lincoln. I mean, he's... He's not someone who punches people out. He's someone who holds himself in abeyance and, and uh, uh, watches and, and figures out the landscape. He's a less active force in a movie than, say, Duke Wayne was. And Leone liked that quality because he wanted to use it to suggest cold-bloodedness, to suggest uh, 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 sociopathy, essentially. And he wanted him to play uh, a, a killer gunslinger. Uh, and Fonda read the script, and he'd never played anything like that before, but he was interested. Uh, but the script didn't read well because it was a clunky translation of the Italian original script. So he called Eli Wallach, who was a friend of his, who'd worked for Leone, of course, in uh, Good, Bad, and the Ugly uh, a year earlier. And, uh, Wallach said, just go. Don't worry about the script. Just do it. Just say yes and go. You'll have a wonderful time. Trust me. And Fonda trusted Wallach, so he went to Italy and had a wonderful time working with Leone. Didn't he show up with a beard? He showed up with a mustache, a, hand, a large a large hand, kind of semi-handlebar mustache. And he was kind of hiding. And Leone said, no, I want, I want the Henry Fonda the audience knows. I, and and uh, I want the baby blues. And uh, so Fonda shaved the mustache off. And they had actually a very effective working relationship because Fonda, unlike many movie stars, liked direction. He wanted guidance because he was such a serious actor and such a pointless actor. At one point, he asked Leone, should I pick up a glass with my left hand or right hand? And Leone didn't care. It was totally irrelevant to Leone. He didn't think like that. He wasn't that kind of director. But he was smart enough to realize that it was important to Fonda and that he needed that kind of specific direction. So he said, oh, use your right hand. You know, but it really didn't matter to Leone, but it mattered to Fonda. So he met Fonda on his own terms. 